You're listening to KDVS Davis 90.3 FM. Thank you for tuning in to the Year in Review, a live forum discussion on the infamous UC Davis pepper spray incident. The following hour and a half of programming is brought to you by KDVS News and Aggie TV. Before we get started, I'm going to provide a quick review of the events that transpired last year leading up to our discussion. Uh, by the way, my name is Mary Champney. I'm the head news director at KDVS, and I'll be leading the discussion today. Beginning in fall of 2011, students, staff, and community members at UC Davis began a series of protests and actions against the potential proposals that would increase the University of California system tuition fees as a result of state budget cuts. On November 15th, about 20 students spent the night in Merak Hall in a peaceful expression of their displeasure with the university's administration. While Chancellor Katehi allowed students to spend the night, they were asked to vacate the building Wednesday at 2.25 p.m., shortly after the Merak staff had been quietly asked to evacuate. Merak was closed and all of the employees were evacuated from the building and the approximately 18 demonstrators were then forced to leave the building by 30 police officers, some in riot gear. On the afternoon of November 17th, students organized an encampment on the UC Davis quad with the intention of spending the night to express their frustrations with fee increases and in solidarity with public university students across the state. Police warned protesters that they would be asked to disperse at midnight when campus closed. However, Linda Katehi waived the closure of the campus that night and instructed the campus police not to intervene. The encampment of about 35 tents remained on the quad through the night. Friday morning, November 18th, Chancellor Katehi issued a letter requesting the dispersal of the encampment by 3 o'clock p.m. that day in accordance with the university policy that prohibits camping on campus. At approximately 3.30 p.m., about 30 officers in riot gear arrived on the UC Davis quad to enforce Katehi's order for the removal of the camping equipment. Demonstrators moved the remaining tents from the overnight encampment into the middle of the quad and linked arms in a circle around them. Protesters then encircled the officers and reiterated their mission of nonviolent protest. Video footage of the subsequent events has been widely circulated on YouTube, Twitter, and other internet sources. When the students refused to move, police used pepper spray to force them to disperse. An officer exited the ring of students by stepping over demonstrators and walked down the line of those seated in the center of the quad, spraying about 10 directly in the face with two sweeps, leaving them drenched in pepper spray. Two officers continued to use pepper spray on individuals who were resisting arrest. In total, 10 students were arrested. Police then left the scene with the arrested students in custody as hundreds of, hundreds of bystanders looked on. 11 of the protesters needed medical treatment and two were hospitalized. The public outcry that occurred in the wake of this event was extreme. Students and communities across the world were outraged, and many called for the removal of Chancellor Linda Katehi and Chief of Police Annette Spakusa. The campus administration was criticized for being slow to produce a public and coherent response to the events that led up to and followed the pepper spraying. On November 21st, an estimated five to 10,000 people gathered on the quad to rally um, for Chancellor Katehi's resignation. Chancellor Katehi apologized at the rally but did not resign. Two UC Davis Police Department officers and Police Chief Annette Spakuza were placed on administrative leave. UC President Mark Udoff appointed Cruz Reynoso, a former California Supreme Court Justice, to lead a task force to address and issue findings related to the pepper spray incident. The 13-member task force released their findings and held a public forum on April 11th. The Reynoso task force provided recommendations on administrative and le leadership response, the UC Davis Police Force, system-wide considerations, and the campus community as a whole. Among the actions proposed was the creation of a task force made up of members of the UC Davis administrative offices to evaluate current campus policies. The University of California engaged the risk management firm Kroll Inc. to assist the task force with the task force with fact finding and identification of best practices. Kroll Inc. completed the final draft of their report on February 2nd, 2012. UC Davis Police Chief Annette Spakuza announced her resignation on April 18th, 2012. She was succeeded by Matt Carmichael, who officially took the position on April 19th after serving as active chief since November 20th. Protest activity on campus continued through the rest of the academic year and into the summer. The beginning of this year, 2012, the students who were involved with the pepper spray incident filed a lawsuit. A preliminary agreement was made on September 27th, 2012, saying that individuals that filed the suit and were pepper sprayed would be eligible for compensation under the settlement if it is approved on January 9th. Also, the settlement ensures that Chancellor Linda Katehi would write a personal apology to each individual affected. The UC Davis community is currently working on creating a model for a civilian oversight committee to oversee campus police action. It's a little bit of an overview for the listeners and a little bit of um, sort of a timeline for the events that we're about to discuss. So um, for those of you who are listening live, we have KDVS staff standing by to man the phone lines. If you have a question or topic you would like to introduce to this discussion, please feel free to call in at 530-752-2777.
Thank you also to Aggie TV, who are here in, here in studio today to film this discussion. Full video coverage will be released following this panel, this panel forum at aggietv.org. So, all right. Pretty soon I'll be done talking and we can hear a couple of other voices. Um, so we have a panel here to address questions that we have prepared and taken from submissions by students and community members. Some of the questions are for specific panel members and some are general questions for anyone to answer. The panelists will indicate to us if they want to respond to another panelist's question or response. We will not be placing any time limits on responses and have asked our panelists to reflect and look to the future rather than dwell on the past. But first, I'm going to ask the panelists to take a moment to introduce themselves and briefly state their backgrounds <clears throat> and their perspectives on this issue. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Justin Groove. I'm a fourth year UC Davis student. Um, I was there during the pepper spray incident um, and involved in some of the activities beforehand. Um, and I'm involved in the um, community, uh, the queer community, um, activist community in a lot of ways. And so that's my perspective on this. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Sterling. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student here at Davis. I'm currently serving as the ASUCD president and I served on the, uh, on the Reynoso task force uh, last year. And I'm Bob Ostertag. I'm a professor here at Davis. Uh, I had some students who were among those who were pepper sprayed um, and I write a blog on the Huffington Post on which I uh, wrote pretty extensively about the events and as a result of that ended up in a bunch of other media. I've also spent most of my life involved in one way or another with social justice causes. Hi, I'm Matt Carmichael. I'm the current UC Davis police chief. I will be at UC Davis now 12 years in January. I've been in law enforcement for about 27 years um, and I'm a dad. Wonderful, thanks. Okay, so this first question is pretty open-ended and pretty broad. Anyone is welcome to answer. If all four of you would like to chip in on this, that would be wonderful. So, do you believe there were any positive outcomes of such a negative and well-publicized event that happened on our campus? Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, well, first of all, uh, drew a lot of attention to the plight of public education in the state of California and public education in the country at large. So that was a fantastic thing. Um, it brought the student community together in an extraordinary way. Uh, that event that's become known as the Chancellor's Walk of Shame is an extraordinary thing that I think will be remembered for a very, very long time all around the world. I mean, extraordinary. Um, it created an enormous amount of political momentum. I think some students on our campus had their lives profoundly affected and changed in a good way. Um, so, and that's just the beginning. So yes, absolutely, no, no doubt there were very positive things. Um, I'll add on a little bit. Um, I think a lot of good has come out of it. Um, and part of that I do think is uh, as a result of some of the leadership staying on campus and having to take responsibility um, for kind of the situation that our campus was left in. Uh, while some of our students, I felt, I think, did feel kind of united and were able to come together after the incident, um, a lot of people did leave feeling very disenfranchised, um, felt very kind of lost or confused with, with what this disconnect was that was on our campus. And I don't think that that is just because of the pepper spraying incident, but I think that might have been kind of consistent tone on our campus, um, that there were members of our leadership that weren't as engaged um, or as connected as they could have been. And since uh, the incident a year ago, I can tell you how many more efforts have been taken uh, by our administration to better reach out, um, kind of we were talking about before um, this panel began, to humanize themselves. Um, and humble themselves and, and really genuinely listen um, to how they, can, how they can move our campus forward in a more united way. All right, thank you oh, Go I, ahead, Justin. Yeah, um, I think I would say that there have been some constructive changes that, or some constructive things that have come up out of the incident. Um, one of them is taking, it is to have a look at the police force as a whole on the university and kind of like evaluating the position there 
And in addition, um, what Rebecca and Bob were saying about um, humanizing the administration, um, I think there's efforts being made to them, but um, I can speak more on that later and my opinions on that. But um, And then also I think it um, helped to radicalize some of the students on campus. I was talking to um, a friend the other day and they were saying after the Pepper Spray incident, it radicalized them, it, it forced them to realize themselves as a political entity. And I think that happened to a lot of students. I think that's a very powerful thing because it showed that students can mobilize and um, have their voices be heard. Um, whether or not that translates to anything down the line, at least at that point, it was something that could happen. Yeah, I, I would say it was, it kind of confirms a, a few things for me. I think the first one is, you know, good change or, or positive change usually seems to follow a catastrophic event or something, you know, something that we, we all share pain through and then, and then change, hopefully for the positive, right? I mean, it's been a little over a year now, which is hard to believe. I think, uh, I, I think personally, it's given me perspective as the chief currently um, that, you know, without community support or without trust of the community, the police department's ineffective. I mean, you, we can do our best and, and, and get the basics done, but if we don't have, if we lose the trust of the community, then, um, you know, it's difficult for us to excel. So I, I think, I like just looking back, um, you know, I know it's no big mystery. I, I was apprehensive at first, but um, I have a true passion, and I and I and I think a lot of people share this because I get an opportunity to work now. I mean, I'm here at KDVS at a table, right on this show. When's the last time police chief sat down in here in the basement on a, on, on a radio show? So there's, I won't take over the table, but there is so much change and so much positive change, and some, you know, the jury's out. I mean, we're gonna have to see. How, the, how this path takes us, but I think there's just an enormous amount of change, awareness, um, and thought that probably we wouldn't have had. You know, unfortunately, Bob and I probably wouldn't be sitting here, you know, 13 months ago. So, thank you guys all so much for that insight. Um, before I move on to the next question, I just want to point out. Um, that uh, in case any listeners are wondering about the perspectives that we do have at this table and maybe some perspectives that are missing, uh, KDBS News did approach many members of the student community as well as victims of the pepper spray incident to find a representative for this panel and we were unfortunately unable to find a participant. Um, the interim vice chancellor of student affairs, Adela De La Torre, was originally um, planning to administrate or to uh, represent the administration today, but was one a unable to make it uh, due to circumstances beyond our control. But um, just a big thank you to all four of you um, who showed up today to be a part of this discussion. Um, so the next question. Uh, can, I, can I speak on that? Um, who's here today for a second? Uh, who's, who are, who's missing? Um, what was kind of interesting for me was the lack of the vice chancellor and the lack of the administration being present here. Um, because of the efforts supposedly given out to humanize themselves and to not take every responsibility to come to discussions like this to humanize themselves. I can understand why folks from the Pepper Spray incident themselves are not here. It might be painful, it might be challenging, but I think it's the responsibility of the administration to show up to something like this. But not to vilify, but just to put that out there. I will point out again, though, that they were very helpful and mm -hmm. it was unforeseen circumstances that led to them not showing up. But so the next question, this is um, something uh, specific you guys can all again uh, answer this. So a widespread call was made for the resignation of Chancellor Linda Katehi, including a petition on change.org which gained tens of thousands of signatures in the days following the uh, pepper spray incident last November. Was this call for her resignation justified? And uh, giving the findings of the Kroll and Reynoso reports, which maybe Rebecca you can speak to a little bit, um, should she have resigned? Sure. I'll, I'll kind of start us off then. Um, I think, first of all, as I kind of said in my in my previous answer, I think it's um, actually been critical to our campus's healing that she did not resign. Uh, I think a lot of the responsibility as a leader uh, is to bear a lot of the burden and is to be willing to take the hit, um, but also to be willing to be confident and strong um, that you're going to make those changes and make sure that they happen for the better. Um, and I, and I, do believe that that's the direction our campus has been going. Um, to speak a little bit to to um, to kind of the original call for her resignation, and then to the reports that came out, um, I think 
when the event happened itself and when the original calls were made for her to resign, almost anyone who heard about the incident was willing to sign on to those. Uh, it was such a dramatic incident. It, you know, the the video clips of it went viral, the images went viral, and and there was a pretty easy um, person to lay the responsibility on, which would be the chancellor. Um, it is her responsibility to make sure that that nothing so terrible goes on on campus, um, which I do agree with. However, um, I do think that it's important, and it what was critical to to wait for the outcome of the reports, um, to to make sure. Uh, I don't think that you know the calls would have been accurate um, to to have been made, and I don't think that it would have um, been in her best interest to resign when when those tens of thousands um, of people made that call. To speak a little bit more to the Kroll and Reynoso reports coming out, uh, they spoke to many issues on campus, uh, many that I think maybe were part of our structure or system for all of UC Davis's history, maybe, you know, the lax nature of different departments on campus or the lack of, of um, institutional knowledge or, you know, kind of structure, even recording, recording meetings, having a structure of how to deal with things is because we don't have a huge history of demonstrations on campus. Um, our campus has never been one of the most activist campuses. Um, but I, I think that they outlined very clearly um, what reforms needed to be made. And, and I do believe that it was the chancellor's responsibility. That is not to say that those, neither of those reports came out with things that, that did directly um, assign some, some blame or some responsibility with the chancellor's office. Um, but that, to me, still did not um, call for her resignation. Uh, in all respect, I completely disagree. <laughs> I, uh, I have to say, I think it's an embarrassment to the institution that uh, Chancellor Katehi is still here. Uh, and I was not somebody who uh, was quick to call for her resignation in the aftermath of the event. Actually, I, I made quite a point of reserving judgment. Uh, but after the Reynoso report, uh, the, the, the level of multiple failures that were uh, placed directly at the chancellor's doorstep, uh, uh, she should resign. Uh, to, to me, I, and, and while Rebecca, I understand what you're saying about taking responsibility means implementing the necessary changes. While I agree with that, uh, failure past a certain level may, it means resignation. That, that, that's what it means. And um, the, re, the, the report that you helped put together was quite an indictment of Chancellor Katehi's uh, leadership of this institution on every level, beginning from the fact that every single meeting of her crisis committee, uh, when the task force interviewed the members of the committee, every single person on the committee had a different understanding of the decisions that were made at, at the meeting. So at the most, I mean, forget about pepper spray in the face of, of students who absolutely did not deserve it, just at the basic level of how to administer a institution as large as UC Davis. Um, she failed, uh, failed dramatically. And uh, uh, I, I think it's an embarrassment uh, that she's still here. I, 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 I'm sorry to say that, but I say that without any hesitation. And I'd also like to add that, uh, you know, there was a, 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 in some ways, a similar police incident at UC Berkeley at about the same time. And the uh, faculty senate at UC Berkeley wasted no time in uh, passing a no confidence vote in the chancellor. And the fact that our senate did not, uh, to my mind, sends the message that. Um, if, if, if university police beat up students, that's okay. They have to beat up faculty for the faculty to respond. Because, you know, at, at Berkeley, there were faculty who got roughed up. It wasn't just students. And the faculty responded immediately. Mm -hmm. And at Davis, it was just students. 
and the faculty essentially did nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's a terrible message. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you both very much. Um, that's one more question, then we'll go to a brief music break. Again, for our listeners, this is KDBS Davis 90.3 FM. You're listening to a Year in Review, a live pepper spray forum discussion brought to you by KDBS News and Aggie TV. Uh, we just had a question submitted by a listener. Um, unfortunately, because we do not have our administrative representative, I'm not sure if anyone will be able to answer this, but I would like to ask it in case anyone can provide some, some insight, and it is um, definitely a, a good, good thing to think about. So this comes from Kevin. In 2011, the Aggie published an article detailing a team surveilling student activism on campus that was put together by then Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Griselda Castro. The team was revealed when students filed a Public Records Act request. What is the current state of that team, and does the university have a program in place like this today? So, I'm not sure if anyone would have <laughs> <specific> <laughs> <laughs> um, I can speak a little bit to that. I don't know... Um, I don't know if they have a kind of a student group like that. I do know that that their policy is to try to have uh, responders or or um, staff available to students um, if any issue arises during a demonstration um, for students to have a resource to go to, um, and that's that's kind of part of their their initiative to have better communication and and to not you know while we respect the police, I respect our police department. I don't think. Uh, their, their goal is definitely to make that not the first option, um, to make it so that there can be some, some more um, level communication. So I do know they have um, some staff that will be available, um, but has also, uh, even in the past week, we had a recent demonstration, and we had a couple members from Student Affairs staff attend the, the demonstration, get in contact with the students. Um, they were asked to leave, and they said, you know, we will respect that, we will leave your demonstration, we will not stay here. However, um, we are we can be a resource too if there's something you need that helps at all. Um, actually, never know. All right. Okay, thank you so much for that, Rebecca. All right, so um, we're going to head to a brief music break. When we come back, we'll talk more about changes uh, that have um, happened, um, policies on campus that have undergone changes since the pepper spray incident, and as a direct result of that event. Um, again, uh, any listeners out there, if you guys would like to call in, um, you can feel free to add to the discussion. Uh, we'll use your questions. Um, you can call us at the KDVS studio. It's 530-752-2777. This is KDVS Davis, 90.3 FM, and uh, we'll see you after the music break. <laughs> 